the book of Acts. We're about halfway through the book. Uh, as you recall, chapter 13 and chapter 14 are kind of labeled as the first missionary trip. Uh, and we'll end that tonight, actually. Uh, we'll get through all, all of chapter 14 when it's done. But you remember at the end of chapter 13, they were uh, run out of Antioch. And so, uh, and they were, they went into really Iconian. Then they were ran out of Iconian and they winded up into a place called Lystra. And we talked about, you know, the miles that they had to travel to do that. And that this is really a Roman wilderness. It was a Roman frontier. Uh, when you get out into Lystra and then later Derby, these are really mostly pagan, mostly Gentile of uh, Roman frontiers. They're very on the very edge, very much almost uncivilized. And, and we're going to see, see that as this unrolls. And as we got into the first section of 14, you know what happened. You know, Paul uh, healed the crippled man. They saw that. They had this legend about Zeus and Hermes coming into town. And uh, so they really put Barnabas as Zeus and Paul as Hermes to honor them. And they had this big ceremony and they were going to sacrifice the best oxen and all was going on and all this was happening in their language. So Paul and Barnabas really didn't know what was going on. They thought they have a bunch of people come in <laughs> to believe. Yeah, the they were all excited about it. And so as we move into verse 14, they finally recognize what's happening. And so uh, it really is going to teach us some stuff here. And so I can't wait to get into the lesson with y'all tonight. So I'll turn it over to that. She'll start with, chap with uh, chapter 14, verse 14. Just a minute to look at the map and see that they started off here in Antioch and then went to Cyprus. From there, they went to Perga, up to Pisidian, Antioch, to Iconium, Lystra, and Derby. And so right now, we're in Lystra. And we'll go here, and then we're going to see that this is going to be the end of this first journey. So they'll be backtracking and coming straight through to Antioch in Syria. So Acts 14, verses 14 through 18. But when the apostles Barnabas and Paul heard this, they tore their clothes and ran in among the multitudes, crying out and saying, men, why are you doing these things? We also are men with the same nature as you and preach to you that you should turn from these useless things to the living God who made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and all the things that are in them, who in bygone generations allowed all nations to walk in their own way. Nevertheless, he did not leave himself without witness and that he did good, gave us rain from heaven and fruitful seasons, filling our hearts with food and gladness. And these, with these things, it could scarcely restrain the multitudes from sacrificing to them. So why do you think that Paul and Barnabas's reaction was to tear their clothes? Well, that was a, that was a Jewish thing going back forever. You know, whenever they were in turmoil, you know, uh, about something, they would <laughs> rip their clothes, you know. So uh, Paul and, I mean, they're grieved here that, that they're doing this, that they're exalting them as gods and not the true God. And, and that's the answer. So this is a Jewish reaction to blasphemy as well as um, mourning, grief, and loss. So there's times that they do this. The first time that it's recorded that they did it, it was when Reuben went back to the well and Joseph was no longer in there. That was the first time he rent his clothes. And that was probably... Um, probably grief and, you know, and terror, you know, guilt a little bit as well. Um, there's several, there's several um, occurrences of this throughout the Bible. David um, tore his clothes when um, Jonathan was killed. Uh, Saul and Jonathan were killed. He tore his clothes. Um, there's different, we'll see that. And then we see it here in the New Testament is, is the last time I think that it's, it's really mentioned. You know, Job tore his clothes, and usually tearing the clothes was accompanied by some other um, um, process, like 
putting dust on your hair or sitting in, in uncomfortable clothing, um, sackcloth type things. They did that. And, and so this was just showing us how deeply, as Robert said, how deeply grieved Barnabas and Paul were at their reaction. Um, but the, the, today, the Jews still practice this, if you would believe that or not, although it's not quite so demonstrative. So usually at a funeral or, or uh, the priest will take a pair of, a, a, an instrument, whether it's a pair of shears or a knife, and will kind of slice the clothes and they, they do it over the heart usually today. So the priest or the rabbi, I guess, I'm sorry, the rabbi would go in and cut the clothing as the symbol of their grief. Yeah, you know, one thing that came up by one of the commentators and pretty much discounted it, but you, you can't take this completely out of the question. So I just thought I would throw it out for you just, just to, to give it some consideration is they were calling Zeus, they were calling Barnabas of uh, Zeus and, and uh, Paul Hermes. And Hermes is the messenger, the teacher, and Zeus is the you know, big guy. So you can, you know, Paul was a scrawny guy, a little guy. Barnabas was of great statue is what we gather. Uh, but anyway, one brought up, and I didn't think about this, they tore their clothes to show them that they were human beings. So they actually tore their clothes to say, look, we're men. Up under this is men. We're not gods. And so that was one interpretation as well. I really think it's more around the Jewish interpretation. But I thought I would throw that out. You can do your own research on it. But I thought it was interesting. That was one of the things that a commentator brought in, that they may wanted to show that they were just men. And by doing that, that was a way to show them. So one of the things that come up here is, a lesson is how do you recognize false teachers? What's one of the most obvious things you can recognize from a false teacher out of this? He doesn't, he doesn't, he doesn't, um, he doesn't give up. He doesn't, he doesn't speak about Jesus. There's no reference to Christ at all. It's more about his, his, his own heart. And, and I think what you're saying, Bobby, is, is, is true, is how you recognize them is because they take the glory. So they're seeking glory for themselves when it should be Jesus, God, is the one receiving the glory. So whenever somebody is preaching, teaching, and everybody's applauding, there's a great speech, a great sermon, and they take that as them doing a great job, uh, you need to watch that person. If they're honoring themselves, and I know we had some discussion around some of the mega churches and some of the charismatic preachers, if they're taking their spiritual gift or charismatic, uh, charismatic teaching or preaching, and they're using it to elevate themselves and promote themselves, you got to be really careful. That is one of the big things we see as a false teacher. They should be saying this is from God, and they should be giving God all the credit. They shouldn't be giving themselves. And so what you see here is Paul and Barnabas recognize that right off. This is not, we, this is not us. We're just human beings just like you. This is the glory of God. We're speaking. God has given us this power. And so that's why they, they fall and rip their clothes and really show that, hey, this is not us. You should, be, you should be honoring and elevating God from this, not us as men. And so that's one of the things that strikes me, and I've seen this over and over. If somebody is really talented about preaching the word or teaching the word, you need, they need to make sure they're giving credit to the proper source, and that's the Holy Spirit, not them. Yeah, they, yeah, yeah, Dave. I, I got to go back to the words of John the Baptist. You know, he must increase, I must decrease. Yeah, absolutely. All right, that's that's a great word to go back to because that's exactly what should happen. Dave, if, you ever, <laughs> if you ever, 
it's happened to me more than once and it's nothing it's just what happened to me i've had people tell me things and i they caught me off guard and they said things and they read scripture and i knew i just cringed in 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 my my chest and stomach area and i knew what they were saying wasn't true and i went i would go to robert pastors uh, different things and get scriptures and work and and found out that i was right people could the holy spirit when you if your heart is right you'll hear things that sound good in your head but they don't jive in your heart and you don't even know and every time that's happened to me through two or three times at least and after I went back in the scriptures and read and studied, I learned that it wasn't true. So we can spot false teachers if our heart is right. And especially if we've been stayed in this word, when they come out with, with, with crazy stuff, we know, you know, and that's, that's the way you, 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 you can spot a false teacher to me. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good point, Dennis. I mean, we're warned over and over in the Bible. You know, Jesus in Sermon on the Mount says, "Be be aware of false prophets that come dressed in wolf, as wolf, that comes sheep. sheep dressed in uh, uh, wolves." Uh, and you 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 have to be careful. And then Paul tells us over, we should always test the Scripture, test what somebody's telling us, take it in with an open heart, but go back and test it constantly and make sure that it does tie back. And so it is what you're saying, though, there's a lot of good preaching that's preaching and sometimes is not scripture based, but it sounds pretty good. And mm -hmm. the point there is we need to go back and test that against the scripture, just as you do. Go back and ask other people and do the research. So perfect example. Uh, I was going to add to that. And I was thinking this from the beginning when you brought this up, but the best way to know a fake or counterfeit is to know the one true one inside yes. and out, around the edges, through the middle, top to bottom. And, mm -hmm. and then you can, it, the false ones will jump out. So there's no substitute for knowing the word of God. Yeah. I, I think Amen. that is a great Amen. point. Uh, so a great point. I think the better you know God, the less you're going to be left to, to false teaching. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, Dave, one more thing. I know we got to move on, but That's all right. uh, we should always beware of a man who doesn't want you to listen to anyone else. <laughs> yeah. That's a good I point. That. Well. So this next question is changing horses here, but uh, interesting point that I didn't get. Uh, after until we started studying this, is why it, are they pointing out and preaching the living God who made heaven, earth, and the sea? This is quite different than we've seen in a lot of Paul's other sermons and teachings. And nowhere in here, as he's starting this, if you look all the way through verse 18, is he really talking to anything other than a living God who made the heavens, earth, and sea? Why do you think that's the case here? I think I think they were referring that back to Jesus. And, and, and I don't think that's yet, but I think he will bring it back in later, but not initially. And, and that's just my opinion. I, I would say that all of their gods came out of heaven, out of the earth, out of the sea, but they were saying, hey, we're telling you about the God that created all this stuff, not a God who came out of something created. Yeah, and, and that's that's exactly right, Charlie. I mean, the, the Greek mythology centered around the gods of the heavens, the earth, and the sea. And so this was a trilogy or whatever you want to call it of gods that's in Greek mythology that they would gather, they would get. They, they were pagans. They had many different gods. They had a God for everything. And Paul's pointing out, 
here, be very careful. There's only one living God. And that's, that is hitting them up in the face. I mean, that is, that's shaking their belief. Let me tell you something about pagan believers and their gods. They're pretty committed. You, they're pretty committed. You had very well have to be careful because you could upset them quickly. So if you look at the tactic that Paul is using, very, very similar to what he used on the Jews. He's first going to them and what they know, what they already have a grasp of. He went to Jews through, through the Old Testament. Your father Abraham, Jacob, Joseph, and the tribe. They, they taught all this knowing that their audience would get it. Here, the audience are Greek and they're pagans. There are all these gods, as you said, probably out of the different areas which they recognize. They had a god of all agriculture. They had a god of rain. They had a god of love. Anything that was good, they made a god out of it. And Paul is pointing out, those are all false gods. They're not living gods. There's only one god that created everything. And that's the god I'm talking about. So it's very, very interesting to watch how Paul takes this not being afraid to confront them because I, I will go back and we'll bring this up again. Remember when Cook landed in, in Hawaii, we had that conversation before. These were pagans who honored other gods. They thought they were gods, but they turned on them quickly. And we're going to see what happens here as well. And so, you know, a person that's, and this is good struck home, a person that is really, into another God or another religion, they may be in it very passionately. And you need to be very careful how you approach that person. You know, you, to say someone, you know, because they believe in another God, oh, you're going to hell. You don't believe in our God. That ain't the way to get to them. So, and I think Paul is teaching us when you have a person that you go to them and what they understand, what they grasp, and then they buy into it, now you open their hearts and their minds to be receptive to what you're saying instead of cutting off their hearts and minds immediately before you ever have a chance to say anything about Jesus. But he hasn't brought up Jesus just yet. So uh, I was going to say here, I remember as a kid, there was a commercial about you don't fool with Mother Nature. I don't remember what it was, whether it was like for <laughs> butter or that was some commercial. I remember it was also and she made it thunder and lightning come. I had no idea really how that went back to play for these pagans and how worshiping mother earth was such a, um, you know, an ingrained thing. I just thought it was like a, I thought it was kind of funny that she did the things she did, but it, in reading this and then studying on their, on how, why they said these exact words, it brought into play all of this, this worship of, of the thing of different groups. Yeah. And the thing here is, I think Paul was dealing with somebody who believes that there is a God, you know, they, they believe there's some force, the cosmos, there's some force out there that they're dealing with. That's a little bit different than dealing with an atheist who believes there is no God at all. So these, these people are God believers, God's God. believers. <laughs> they're a bunch of little God believers. Uh, and so that's a different thing. So, uh, they're, they're very much understood, the, the earth, the heaven, and the sea. And that just shows you how great it is that Paul's being led by the Holy Spirit to be able to get to him. So the next question is, what's the meaning of generations being permitted to walk in their own ways? What, is that just a phrase I should be reading over, or is it telling me something? What do you think this is teaching us? It sounds like that's no longer permitted, but when I look at our nation and the way we're walking in our own ways, having rejected God the way we have, <laughs> it seems like it's still going on to me. Well, this is basically the most, I think the most simplified way anybody can point to God's sovereignty and man's free will. So I think we're seeing this laid out that God is sovereign, and how did man walk their own way? Were they enticed to walk their own way? Were they forced to walk their own way? No, 
they were permitted to walk their own way. And so it's showing us um, that, that this is, there are people, I, I think as Robert started to say where he didn't quite, well, he wasn't sure, there are people who feel like this verse is saying that, um, that well, God's not going to judge anyone before the church age because he uh, permitted them to walk in their own ways before the church age, before Christ. Mm. But you cannot really read verse 16 and just forget that verse 17 is there. What is verse 17 telling us? <clears throat> Nevertheless, he did not leave himself without a witness. And that he did good, gave us rain from heaven for fruitful seasons, filling our heart with food and gladness. And with these things, it could scarcely restrain themselves. What is that telling us? What's the very next, what is verse 17 telling us or discussing? Even though the nations went their own way, he still provided. He, which is called common grace, correct? We've talked about common grace before, and common grace is for everyone. God is grace, but this, this, and that's per, I mean, this is uh, obviously an uh, <coughs> Paul using this theology we have today, it wasn't back then, called common grace. And by the grace of God, he gave rain, he gave fruitful seasons, uh, and provided food for everyone. And you, we've had this conversation before. Everybody has free will, even today. Yeah. And and that, Go ahead, Robert. I, I was just going to say that reminds me of Jesus teaching that he causes it to rain on the just and the unjust, right. you know. So That's in Sermon on the Mount as well. He, he teaches that as well. That's exactly right. So I think the point here is we, that we get to this is that God is sovereign. We get that. But man has free will. And our free will can reject God. And God <laughs> still has grace. He wants no one to perish. But God is in judgment as well. And we've had that conversation. He's equally judged. Is he, is he equally loving? My, my mind just went blank. So I know we have common grace. Is the other one saving grace? Yeah. Is that the opposite, the second one? So saving grace is only given to those who believe. Common grace is something that all mankind shares, like the sunshine and the rain. Okay. Interesting that we find this here, right? It's not even, he's not sitting down and saying, okay, I'm giving you a doctrine lesson. <laughs> um, as Luke writes this, he's not saying that, but he's doing it. Okay, next one. Then the Jews from Antioch and Iconium came there, and having persuaded the multitudes, they stoned Paul and drug and dragged him out of the city, supposing him to be dead. However, when the disciples gathered around him, he rose up and went into the city. And the next day he departed with Barnabas and Derby to Derby, which is another town. And when they had preached the gospel to that city and many disciples, they returned to Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch, strengthening the souls of the disciples, exhorted them to continue in their faith, and saying, we must, through many tribulations, enter the kingdom of God. Now, wait a second. Here's a guy that stoned, presumed to be dead. They threw him out of the city dead. He gets up, he goes right back into the city. That's boldness, I'm gonna tell you. That's boldness right, in, right up front. So with that, the first question is, why would you think these Jews from Antioch and Iconium come to Lystra to stir up trouble? They, they were trying to defeat the way, the Lord. I mean, they, they were after promoting Judaism, and they were out to crush. Okay, and let, let's. Yeah, and I think that's correct. Let's go back for a second, and you know, Antioch is not a short walk to Lystra. 
to come from Antioch and, and Icon, uh, Iconium. Some of these Jews have walked over a hundred miles to get there. In mountainous, rugged, dangerous territory. So that that this is a revengeful heart. This is hatred coming to be able That's to take hard. that kind of physical pain on in order to persecute Paul. Now, the other thing that's interesting here is they, they ran them out of Antioch. They were ready to stone them in Iconian, and they left before they were stoned. So these Jews are frustrated they haven't gotten to Paul yet. So I think there's some frustration built up here. And I think it's the Jews that led to the persecution in Antioch. It was Jewish leaders stirring up the Gentiles. It was the Jewish leaders that stirred up the Gentiles in Iconian. The, now, what we suspect is Paul does not tell us that when, I mean, Luke does not tell us when Paul entered Lystra, he went to the synagogue. If he did, don't you think Luke would have said that? He said it in the other two cities. But he doesn't say that. So very likely, this is a very even, rough, uh, wilderness town of the Roman Empire. Very few Jews, no synagogue, pagan worship completely. They have now moved out of where there's a friendly, receptive area in the synagogue to receive an incoming uh, Pharisee like Paul to an area that there is no synagogue and probably no Jews. So the Iconian, I mean, the uh, Lystra group wouldn't have registered anything of Judaism in what he was saying. So the Jews came there really to incite. And that's why they came all the way because there were no Jews or not a big enough group of Jews in leadership in Lystra to really do that. So the next question here is, I'll turn it over to Annette. Is, I think is Dave already answered this, why involve the Gentiles to plot to no, stone, I haven't. I haven't to stone it. <laughs> um, in it that this was not a Jewish population here. This is a very far outlying area. They don't have a synagogue. There's just probably not enough um, Jews to carry out this process successfully. So they're involving the Gentiles also by stirring up and involving the Gentiles um, they're less likely to face scrutiny or persecution on their own from the residents there for these outsiders coming in and, and disturbing their town. So I think they had two, two, um, two goals in mind. One was to gain enough numbers so that they could successfully um, go, follow through with the stoning. And the second one would be to self-preservation to just gain acceptance by the residents prior to um, Stoning Paul. Yeah, and I think the other thing that was brought up is the Jews themselves, though they didn't pay attention to it sometimes, really had no legal right up under Roman law to put somebody to death. You go back to Jesus's trial, and the reason why they didn't kill Jesus is because they didn't have the authority to do it. They had to go to Pilate because Pilate was one that had the authority. So in all reality, the Jews don't even have the authority to stone someone. That didn't stop them from stoning Stephen, by the way. So I'm not saying that can't be the case, but I do think they're in a, a remote city with no Jewish presence. And for them to go and murder Paul uh, would have been quite difficult. So they had to incite the Gentiles and get them to, to do this act. And, and remember what I said earlier, these are very religious pagan people. And they thought Paul and Barnabas was gods. And now they're deceived and say they're just men. So I think you could, you could easily incite them and rile them up and get them against them uh, very easily. And so obviously, I think it's because of the lack of Jews, the lack of their legal authority, and there is no 
Jewish presence there, they had to use the Gentiles to carry this out. So do you think it was really a miracle where Paul was dead and resurrected? I don't think so. I, I don't think it was a miracle. I, I just, I, I, I don't think it, it was his time. He had just begun his ministry. And I know that he, he went through, that was a lot. I don't know. Personally, I don't want to get stoned, you know, but, but, but I don't think it was a miracle. Uh, Jesus wasn't present. There was no laying of the hands. The Holy Spirit was there. Uh, he was under God's protection. And uh, I mean, the Lord told him that he, he, he'd go through many trials and tribulations, but, but take heart, I, I, I've overcome the world. I, I just don't think that he, that he died and was resurrected. Well, and there's a, there's a split in the commentators on that. Uh, so, go ahead, Robert. I think it was a miracle. I don't think Paul died, but I think it was a miracle. Because if they truly stoned him, he would have so many broken bones and so many internal organs ruptured and torn up. He wouldn't have been able to get back up and go back into the city. Exactly. <laughs> So it was a miracle. That's the right answer. <laughs> yeah, and I, and I got I think, that. Yeah, a lot, a lot of commentators lean towards that. This is a miracle. It's what miracle you want to look at. <laughs> uh, whether he was resurrected or whether he was stoned, how he got up immediately after being stoned. Now, the one thing that some commentators latched into is, and, and we'll go back and, and, and look at this. If you look at supposing he was dead, they dragged him out of the city, supposing him to be dead. We don't think about that when we're reading this scripture, but why put that in there, number one? Number two, if this was really a resurrection, don't you think Luke would have made it clear? Luke back in the cripple made it clear that he was crippled from the womb, he never walked. He went into great detail about this cripple and about the miracle that was done. That was about a cripple. You don't think he would have went into great detail that Paul was resurrected from the dead. So a lot of them are arguing that supposing being thrown in this verse, the way Luke throws it in, <coughs> it is always used in the New Testament as saying opposing the truth. Supposing something that is not. So supposing him to be dead would always be taken where it's used in the New Testament most of the time. It would mean supposing he was dead is a wrong assumption. It's wrong. That supposing him dead is wrong. That's the way it's used in most of the Old Testament. So what Luke is doing is he threw that in here, which most commentators, and I tend to lead that way, indicate this was not a death and resurrection, but it was a miracle, as Robert put out. It was a miracle, clearly, that the man was stoned, would have had bruises, broken bones, and would have, would have taken probably months to recover. He's up immediately and goes right back in the city preaching where he just got stoned. Uh, uh, I just can't even comprehend that. So the next question is, why would he return to the cities that he had already visited? So he's in Lystra. He's leaving there. We see here he leaves there and goes to Derby and starts a church there. Many disciples and believers. Then he comes back through Lystra, Iconium, Antioch. These cities that he was run out of. He escaped um, Iconium because he found out they were going to um, stone him. He was stoned in Lystra. He left Antioch because of the persecution that arose there. Um, why is he going back to these cities where there was so much trouble that he left under horrible situation? Why would he go back there? I would think that he's going there to reinforce their faith, just to minister to them and uh, encourage them and exhort them, you know, <laughs> to, to keep growing in the spirit. And, and that's the right answer. Paul, we know through all of his writings, through everything he did, had a passion to check up, follow up, 
encourage the believers, strengthen their faith, encourage them to stay in the word or in the Lord, to continue in, in the Lord. Um, he did that nonstop. And that's who he was. So of course, he's following up, he's going back, he's going back. Because if you look at when they came to these cities for the first time, they went to the synagogues and they were trying to make converts. But as they went back through these cities on revisits, they weren't going to the synagogues and trying to get more converts. They were going back. They were continuing to teach the disciples, build the disciples, bring them along, increase their knowledge. And at that point, once he had left and even when he came back, it's the job of the disciples in the church now to be bringing in the new converts and to begin discipling in them. And this is a really important thing for us to remember that you look at some of these big crusades or these big um, salvation conferences and stuff where people, hundreds of people walk down to the altar and get saved and then they're released to go back into their life. And, and it's very difficult for them to have a successful walk with Christ in those situations. It's so incredibly important for us, if we know of new converts or something, to work with them, to make sure they're being discipled, to help teach them the word and bring them along until they come to a point where they're able now to start helping with discipling other people and things. So don't forget how important it is to share um, what you know about the Bible with people that, um, with everyone. I mean, just build the church and share share the knowledge. Yeah, and let, let's not, when we get into the, the closing verses here, you're going to see that when they went back to these cities, they were meeting with small church groups. They were, they were meeting with, with basically church plants. And we're going to see what they had to do. And so they were going back to these cities. They weren't just passing through. They were staying in each city for a certain length of time. They'd have to. When we get to the closing verses, you'll, you'll see that more clearly pointed out. But this last verse before we move on is interesting that Paul says, we must, through many tribulations, enter the kingdom of God. So the question is, is are we required to go through tribulations to make it to heaven? Because there's a lot of theology and a lot of preaching on that very thing I just said. Well, I say no, it's not required. But between justification, becoming a child of God, and the kingdom gate, there's a whole lot of tribulation because we're still in Satan's world, which is a place that sucks. And some people get a lot of problems. Some people get a few, but nonetheless, it's like a roll of the dice. You never know what you're going to get the next day, but this is a deep, dark, sinful world. There's a lot of suffering and anguish in it, and the Lord warned us, and that's what I think Paul was going back and encouraging these people, because they were going through a lot. It's not like our, yeah. our but, concert and, country club churches today, they, they had their hands full. A lot of people have their hands full today, too, with things other than persecution, just, you know, family having medical problems, other things, there's a lot going on. So that's what I think. I I, 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 I agree. I agree with that. But I think I think more more so is that is that because of the condition of the world as it is falling, we we do go through them. Yeah. I mean, there's no avoiding it. We're yeah, going to go through trials on. and tribulations, and I think that's what required means in this verse. Well, I'm gonna, I, I, I think I agree with everything that was said. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you some clarity to it. Uh, first, it's, it's my opinion, just my opinion. Anybody that says you have to go through tribulations to make it to heaven is false teaching. Yeah. Because we make it to heaven by believing in our Lord Jesus Christ. He suffered, he bled, he died for our sins. That's why we go to heaven, mm -hmm. not by tribulations that I have to encounter. There's these some people now, you know, stab themselves and, and do all these strange things thinking they have to take physical pain on in order to be, you know, accepted into heaven. 
And I just think that's dangerous. Do your own research there. So I'm real passionate about this is a, a real wrong theology. With that said, I'm going to read with one of the commentators. It's Jack Andrews. I'm going to read his quote exactly so you can hear it because it strikes right into the heart of this question. Christians do not go through tribulations to get to heaven. But Christians go through tribulations because they're going to heaven. Yeah. You That's understand? Right. Yes, sir. So we're going to go through tribulations because we're going to heaven because we're saved. And people are going to, Jesus Christ tells us, we're going to have tribulations. Yeah. But I have overcome the world. You know, so yeah. the fact is, we are going to have tribulations. I think this is Paul telling them they're going to have tribulations. You, believe, you keep your faith. You continue in the faith. But you're going to have tribulations. I don't think there's any indication, and we got this from none of the people we're following, that we have to go through tribulations in order to enter heaven. No. Only is why we go through tribulations is because we are going to heaven. It's because we are a believer. We are saved. We are a child of God. And we have put our whole trust, faith, and hope in Lord Jesus Christ. That's why we're going to pursue. Dave, That's why we're going to have tribulations. Go Dave? Ahead. Yeah. Jesus said, if the world hated me first, it's going to hate you. Absolutely. We, we, Charlie said something there that I agree with. Some people go through tribulations that aren't saved. You know, everybody goes through tribulations. But Job went through them. And God got Job from a religious man to a person that had seen God. Yeah. I believe Job was religious before. When he went through his tribulations, he, he was like superstitious about God. And when he went through his tribulations, then he knew God. He saw God. He knew for then that God was really real. You know, it says narrow is the gate and yeah. hard is the way. We have a gate and we have a way to salvation. Okay? And hard is the way. And then, you know, um, the Bible says those that endure to the end will be saved. And I believe that to be exactly the way it's written. So there's a way and there's an endurance that we go through. Okay. I believe that we can quit on God. And he's not going to, you know, I think that's a rare thing, but there is a gate and then there is a way. There's people that endure to the end to be saved. But the, 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 the tribulations don't save us. It makes us stronger. Right. And I know a lot of people don't believe that. But Well, God promises we're not going to go through them alone, right? He's going to bear the what? tribulations. What's that now? Well, God I'm sorry, promises, that. God promises uh, that we're not going to go through tribulations alone. He's with us. He's oh, with no. us. No, no, no. So, we couldn't I mean, make it through them alone. Right. And we can only, how we react to our tribulations is what really counts. If, if we sit there and just moan and groan and give up and don't care, we're not going to learn what God is trying to teach us. We'll stay in our tribulations longer until we find out what we're learning from that. God is trying to teach us stuff. He tried to teach Job, and he did. And he will teach us and we, you know, he said we should rejoice in, how does the Bible say that? Rejoice in our in our bad times. Um, I'm not putting that in the right words. But anyway, I said off what I needed to say. I'm sorry. Okay. So let's finish up with verses 23 through 28. So when they had appointed elders in every church and prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord in whom they had believed. And after they had passed through Pisidia, they came to Pamphylia. Now, when they had preached the word in Perga, they went down to Italia, and from there they sailed to Antioch, where they had been commended to the grace of God for the work which they had completed. Now, when they had come and gathered at the church together, they reported all that God had done with them, and he had opened the door of faith 
to the Gentiles so that they stayed there a long time with the disciples. So how long do you think this first journey lasts? And nobody can have any idea. Mm -hmm. Um, it, they, they, if they look at the historical records and they look at what was going on at the time, they look at who was ruling at what time and what mentions or what monies are found where, et cetera. So just archaeological um, estimates are that they were on this journey anywhere from about a year and a half to about five years um, based on the distance travels and the, and the activities that were going on in each place. We have no idea exactly how much, and I don't think it matters how much other than it's saying that they were there a while, they stayed a while, but here they get back to Antioch and the church and they're staying there for a long time. So I don't know what that long time is, but there is going to be a nice big gap where they're working at this um, Syrian Antioch before their second missionary journey. And one of the things that we mentioned, it's Paul's style, <coughs> his pattern to go back and reinforce his teaching. You know, he, he wrote several epistles and followed up with an epistle, right, to the same group. Uh, but if you notice here, it says they sailed from Panthithia back to uh, Antioch, and they bypassed Cyprus. So he did not go back through Cyprus and trace the things he did in Cyprus. We don't have an answer for that. We really don't. So we know it's pretty clear he went back to the other towns, but he didn't go back through Cyprus and reinforce that. And my only guess for what it's worth is that he stayed there longer and worked at each place longer because there's no record of him being running out, run out of a city when, we, when he was in Cyprus. It was, it was a big Jewish area. Actually, Barnabas was raised you know, on the island of Cyprus. He's the one that donated the land uh, in the early church, if you remember, sold land and gave the proceeds. So Barnabas was there. So I think very likely the need of Paul to go back there was not there. And that's the reason we don't see that. There's not a clear answer. But with that said, and we look at this first missionary journey ending, what do you think the focus we, is is here for us as it ends. To establish churches. Establishing churches, making convert evangelism, going out in missionary work. Yeah, all those. But there's a there's one other big item here that we don't want to overlook. To build up the strength of the believers? To build up the strength of the believers? Yeah, that's just yeah, that's, that's yeah. the word you're looking for, Dennis, and you're using the definition is discipling. Yeah. Okay. okay. Building up a believer and teaching a believer is the underlying duty of your church. The church should be discipling, bringing people to maturity. And the danger here, and we get this repeated over and over, and I, I, I recognize this, in reality today, you get some people that get excited about coming to Jesus. So they walk down the aisle and they get baptized or, or whatever. And there's this there's this excitement for a period of time. It's a grand feeling. It's a good feeling. You cannot leave those people to themselves. Yeah. You have to disciple them. You have to get them off of the milk the initial milk and put them on solid food. And that's deep in the scripture. And that's what we're doing here. That's what this teaching is all about. It's making disciples out of all of you. And you make disciples out of other people. That's what the underlying message, many of the commentators that I would not have gotten on my own points to, that we have to go back and reinforce people's faith. Try to get them to continue in the faith because they're gonna have little hiccups and little trials and little doubts, particularly a new believer. And they it needs the maturity of a believer to be alongside of you new believers and bringing them in to discipleship. 
And so it's very key here to not miss the point, the importance of discipleship that there is. So I wanted to make sure we pointed that out because the most commentators really will label this is the whole, the whole journey's reason is to teach discipleship, is to teach the, uh, the Bible. And that's what Paul and Barnabas is doing. I, when they're staying, now you notice they went and they made, they made elders, they selected elders uh, around each church. So they did do organization, church organization as they went back. Uh, but they were also discipling the people, preparing them to disciple the rest of the church. And so it gives us a good pattern and it gives us really directions. You know, we had this conversation many times. Jesus is, says for us to be his witness to the world. We talked about witnessing. That's a command from Jesus. And that, that is what we should be doing. We should be witnessing and, and describing his word to the world. Uh, and we're all in various different stages of maturity. The saddest thing that several commentators brought up, and I've been there myself, so I'll, I'll take all the blame, uh, is you call the first two years of Christian life a new Christian. Well, I've been a Christian for 20 years. Oh, great. They're still a Christian for two years. Why? Because they came to know Christ, went down, they were baptized, they went to church almost every Sunday. They made a participated, worked on a committee. They were not in the Word every day. They were not in the intense Bible study. They weren't improving or growing in their knowledge and their relationship with God. So they're they're Christian. They're saved, and but they're a, a two year Christian that's been a Christian for twenty years instead of a twenty year Christian that has grown in their knowledge of Christ and their relationship with God, and their maturity, and how to handle, as you said, Dennis, tribulations. There are going to come. How do we handle them? And sometimes it's having another Christian uh, person, strong and mature, that helps us through that tribulation. So the, the point here is, is growing in knowing Christ is a concept of work. <laughs> it's more than a church, occasional church service. And, and like God commanded us to make disciples. And a lot of us think that's to make converts. And making disciples is not the same as making converts. Of course, we have we want converts. We want everyone to, to learn who Christ is and to know Christ. But really, God commanded, Christ commanded to make disciples. And so, again, we have to be so careful about <clears throat> whether we're newly new believers, um, not just stopping, as Dave just described, or whether... Um, we know new believers, we should be alongside them. <clears throat> Any other closing comments or, or questions? Dave, what you said reminded me of a, an amusing story that an ex co worker of mine told me. He was working for a big plant somewhere in Texas, and there was this guy always bragging about his 35 years of experience, and everybody was getting tired of it because the guy was not very. He was not very much of an asset to the company at all, but he was always bringing up his 35 years of experience. And finally, one day, a fellow co-worker just couldn't take it anymore. And he said, you know what? Some people get 35 years of experience, but other people get one year of experience 35 times. And he, <laughs> he never brought that up again. <laughs> That is very good. Good story. That's exactly the same. That's, that's, that's exactly, exactly very talking. right. Very yeah. clearly. I used to like the guys that had 150 years experience. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You know where I'm going? <laughs> okay. Any other closing words? Let's close in prayer. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time to come together. And I thank you for doctrine that you've laid out very clearly for us, for us to find. And I thank you for studies like this where we might pass over something as just part of the retelling of a historical event, but we see so many truths in there. And I just pray that as we go through this, um, we'll continue to read the scripture with a fine tooth comb, that we're looking through the words and the meanings 
that will have a desire to grow in you and to, to disciple, um, be discipled and to disciple others. I just pray that you would help us to have a passion like Paul did to follow up with people and, and help um, bring people to know you better so that while they're on their path, they're, um, as Dennis shared, their um, chances of making it to the gate of enduring to the end are much greater through the word. We praise you and thank you. Be with us as we go through this week and we pray that you'll bring us um, back safely next week. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.